What is going on, everybody? Welcome and happy Tuesday. We are back for another episode of Tatro Talks. As you can hear, I'm losing my voice a little bit, which is quite ironic for a show called Tatro Talks, but hey, here we are. We're pushing through. And luckily, I won't have to be doing much of the talking today because we have a great interview with Theos Mago. So get ready for that. But I want to do some uh, table setting first. Let's talk about some logistical stuff that's going on. First of all, the artist we're interviewing today, Teos, has a pro session coming up this weekend with 343 Labs. And if you don't know what a pro session is, it's basically like a weekend deep dive with an artist uh, behind some of their projects, behind some of their setup, their production techniques, um, their musical process in general. So that's really exciting. So as we go through the interview today, or if you're already familiar with Theos, um, if you want to think about joining that pro session, the link is in the description. And also for 24 hours after this interview is live, you can get a discount on the pro session. And that's with the code Tatro Talks. All that info is in the description though. So keep an eye on that. We are, of course, brought to you by 343 Labs, which is an electronic music school based in Berlin, New York, and online. Um, classes on Ableton Live, Logic, synthesis and sound design, mixing and mastering, all that good stuff. Um, so if you are interested in leveling up your music production skills, it's worth it to check out 343labs.com. Not to mention we've got streams all the time, multiple times a week on youtube.com slash 343labs, and I know a lot of you are watching from there. Um, so thank you to everybody who is watching from the 343 Labs YouTube channel. If you're watching from my channel, take a minute, open a new tab, trying really hard to get 343 Labs to 10,000 subscribers. That would be amazing. So consider going to subscribe over there. That would be great. It would mean a lot. And I see some folks in the chat already. As usual, when we get into it with the guest, if you have questions that come up and they make sense in the conversation, I'll do my best to weave them into the conversation. So please feel free to uh, leave those in the chat as we go. Um, as usual with our guests, it's great to hear their journeys. It's great to hear uh, the process of a you know professional musician, producers, DJs, um, people who are really doing it. So I think there's value in this interview, even if... Um, it, with all the interviews, even if you haven't heard of any of the artists that we've interviewed, um, it's worth it to hear the journey and maybe you'll discover your new favorite artist today. Who knows? But I want to say hello to everybody in chat. Hello to Jesse, who became a member right before the stream started. Thank you so much for becoming a member. We just recently hit 137k subscribers. Thank you for that and surpassed 150 members. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, my mom and dad are in the chat. What do you know about that? Emilio, hello. Um, what is going on? Blade, Ray Calvin, Samuel Messiah. Powell watching over on uh, 343 Labs channel. Hello. OSR The Journey. What's going on? Basha is here. The Random Name X. Hello. Random Name, random name X says, I bought your merch. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Gabriel Macedo. What's going on? And Shazam. Hello. Thank you all for being here. Oh, Max Wild is here, of course. Happy to see you, Max. Thanks for joining today. Dayolo Bros, Brawl Gamers. Hello, 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 everybody. All right, the music that you're hearing right now in the background, at least I think that you're hearing it, is by our guest. And uh, I think that we've done enough of an intro. I think it's time to get in to the interview. Lots to talk about with our guest today. So please help me in welcoming our guest, Deus Magu. Deus, welcome to the show. Thank Hi. you for being on. How are you, Nick? Thanks I... for inviting me. Yes, this is a great opportunity, great chat. Thank you for taking the time for being on the show. Um, I like to start these interviews, um, with asking you, I know like a lot of times electronic musicians, they get thrown under the umbrella of DJ producer and yeah, those are accurate terms, but I would love to hear how, uh, when somebody asks you what you do, uh, what do you tell them? How do you define what you do as a musician, as an artist, as a DJ? Yeah, I, I guess I'm more of a producer than a DJ, Totally, but I've been DJing uh as yeah for the same amount of time that i've been producing so both and uh before the the pandemic uh i used to dj as a living so yeah i think i'm both things nice do you find that uh djing is maybe slightly more of a viable pathway to to make a living versus production is that sort of what, what draws a lot of people to that? Because I hear that from a lot of people. I'm not sure if it's more viable. It was for me because, I don't know, that's that's the path I got. Yeah. I chose, I guess. And uh, 
I got into it uh, since I was 20 years old or something, 18 wow. years old. And but it's it's a good question because now it's changing. Totally. Since I'm not teaching a lot, I'm uh, looking for new incomes, new sources of income, and producing producing for other people, mixing for other people, mastering. That's some of the things I I used to do way less than I do now. Right. Yeah. And how are you so, liking that kind of transition? Um, are you dying to get back on stage? Are you dying to do more of the performing? Or are you sort of liking this new stage that you're in? I like it. I, actually, I prefer to be at the studio more time and make uh, an income of it. Because it used to be more like to produce my own productions. And I mean, the studio time used to be um dedicated to that and it didn't translate it into money directly you know because right. releasing music can make you some money but uh not not really a lot unless you're like more mainstream or have a lot of streams and stuff but in my case it didn't mean like a, a big revenue so it was mostly to promote myself doing music. And I guess a lot of producers are in the same situation, especially like dance music, underground dance music producers. Um, so, so yeah, uh, now that I'm spending more time at the studio to, to have a revenue of it, it I like it. It's a, uh, yeah. I think I think I'm comfortable nice. with uh, this situation. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah, but I mean, it's still not the same as compared to DJing. Of course. But but it's it's growing. I mean, it you have to make a network of it. You have to have more clients. You know. Yeah. Grow and I want way. I want to get into all that because I think you could probably share a lot of a lot of wise advice for our audience out there. But let's take it back. Let's actually go from where it all started. Uh, how did you get into this world? It sounds like maybe DJing came first. Like, what, what was the start? Yeah, it was kind of almost at the same time. But I guess I started DJing around 15, 16 years old. Uh, my friend had, a, had one turntable, actually, and a mixer. Nice. He didn't even have two turntables. Uh, he had one turntable and one CD player. Yeah. There you go. So, so you're mixing yeah. between the two. <laughs> yeah, we had to to mix between the two, and that's how I learned with him. He's my best friend still to date, and I actually run a label with him. Awesome. And yeah, that was around 16 years old and I don't know maybe a few months later I probably got into Reason Propeller Heads Reason I probably downloaded a, a you know a copy an illegal copy of it because back then it was so easy allegedly who can say allegedly yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah I started uh, making music with uh, with reason nice. and i think i i i kept doing music with it like for three or four years then i switched to i think it was cubase and then wendell and uh, and finally to ableton and i've been using ableton live for like 10 years wow more. so you got the whole experience you got that foundation of uh the cubase and reason what made you uh what made you hop between them? Were there things that you were missing? Where did you find that there were things in your process that you needed from different types of software? Um uh, I don't know. Probably it was a bit of hype. Uh I got the hype at, uh, about Ableton because when I started using it, I I don't think I used the session group, which sure. is uh for me, it's the most distinctive part of Ableton. Of course. Um, 
So I I cannot recall a, like a real reason to change from Cubase and to Ableton. Uh, yeah, probably the hype. But then I discovered uh, the session view and and I use it a lot. And I think I always encourage my students to use it because not many people use it. Even even if they uh, use Ableton Live, they don't use the session view. And I'm like, What's guys, the point? this is the, this is the best part of Ableton. You should use it. Totally. I mean, it does the thing of. Uh, for me, I use Session View as a musical sketch pad at times, but then it's also a, a valuable performance tool. And then I find sure. a, a lot of people that swing the other direction that almost exclusively use Session View have a lot of t uh, trouble finishing tracks because they don't know how to properly get their ideas over over onto the arrangement. So like, it's a double edged sword on that front. But before we yeah. dive into like nitty gritty of like live and all that stuff, I, I wonder, um, did having an experiences with DJing and, and getting that start that way and then also learning production, did it inform the kind of music you were making? Like, who were you being influenced at the time and what made you say, okay, I want to make my own tunes. I don't want to just uh, DJ with other people's music. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I started DJing, I was into progressive house music. It was the, the days of the global underground sound. Nice. And I was uh, into that. You know, all this John Digwood, all these British guys, mostly. Uh, and uh, I I also used to listen to other types of music, like uh, Fortet and, you know, stuff like that. I, I've always listened to uh, a lot of different types of music. Actually, I, I studied classical music, so... Oh, tell me about that. I, yeah, the, there was a time I didn't even listen to electronic music because I was, I wanted to be a classical guitar performer. Oh, okay. So, uh, I, yeah, I abandoned a, a bit of the production, but it's so competitive. Totally. And, it's a totally different scene. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be like really like a virtuoso. Eight hours and, a day of practicing and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, eight hours a day of practice and and not really create. I mean, you can, of course, you can compose, but I was studying performance and- uh, I was just learning repertoire all day. Yeah, and I was not composing for classical guitar. I was, when I had time, free time, I used it for, uh, to produce music, right. electronic music. So yeah, when I ended the career, I didn't want to be a classical guitar performer anymore. Nice. And that's where I started teaching like, uh yeah full time almost yeah i i i started to have my first paid gigs when i was like 20 21 uh yeah and then i i got into a, a rock band kind of yeah new wave synth rock band that uh, they're still playing they're called great villa actually they play uh, a lot in the us on festivals and i played with them uh, for like two or three years but then i stopped to you know to focus to focus on my projects on uh, back then i was i wasn't called teus mago my name was buffy b-u-f-i uh, i still release some music under that name yeah but it, yeah mostly now it's uh teus mago I want to dive deeper into this idea because you just took us through this whole journey of like, okay, there's you as the classical guitar player and then you as the producer, you as the DJ, and then this artist name and then that artist name. Like, how yeah. do you, uh, what, what, uh, let's, what's the best way to ask this question? I want to talk about focus as an artist. Do you feel that like there is the need to have these different identities for you as an artist to express yourself in all these different ways? And, and like, do you have find benefits of that? And do you find also like, um, you know, drawbacks of that? Yeah, you know, it, that's that's been a, uh, an important subject for me and a difficult subject because, um, yeah, I, I had the. I have different projects because I have different musical interests. 
I guess Buffy was more uh, inclined towards new disco sound, sound, kind of sound, a bit more uh, joyful, I guess. Yeah. A bit more funky. And uh, when I started to have, I, I started to listen a lot more uh, kind of electro clash music, but uh, not. Well, I used to listen to a lot of Electro Clash back, back in 2008, 2010. But around 2014, I started to listen a little bit more techno and a little bit more obscure things. Darker stuff. Yeah, darker stuff. When I was, I, I was living in Paris with my wife. We lived there for a year. And I got in touch with, a, with a, this kind of sound that it's now uh, run by labels like uh, like Correspondent and uh, yeah, a little bit compact. Uh, yeah, so back then it was like uh, the, the beginning of the genre that we call now dark disco, I guess. I don't like to label genres with names. Right. But uh, yeah. It was kind of that sound, and that's the sound people say that uh, I do, kind of. Uh, so yeah, I I I changed the the name because of that. And going back to your question, if I if I got like benefits from it, and the thing is, I I realized that I'm not a you know like a super socially network guy i i always struggle with that yeah you know with doing socials and so over the time i tend to be more and more like behind behind the scenes like kind of a obscure producer and totally yeah and my experience is that it's it's not uh counter what, what's the word it's not negative it, it it doesn't have a negative impact in your career to not not to do social network networking that much people might think that uh, if you're not doing socials uh, you're lost nowadays and you, i used to think like that but then i realized that the most important thing in my style of music of course is just releasing music and right making having like a regular output quality output and and that's it. The people that uh, need to hear you are gonna hear you. Like, I I mean, like they need to hear you in, in order to, for you to have a career, like promoters, you know. For sure. Yeah. So. So yeah, I mean, uh, of course, social networks can help and can give you more exposure, but I think there's uh, like you know this. A little bit of mystery side if you are not overly exposed to sh to social networks that can also work. I'm not saying that. Uh, yeah. There's only one approach. Yeah, know? it's not exclusive. I, I think yeah. it, it comes down to like what makes you happy as an artist, right? Like if you want to just put the stuff together, um, if you love just making the music and you want to be on that more mysterious side. In a lot of ways, it's it's similar to the days of old celebrity, like like pre social media, like now. Everybody can share so many different parts of their lives when before with celebrities and musicians and DJs alike, there was that air of mystery. You didn't know what they were having for breakfast and you didn't know where they went on vacation. Um, and somehow that allows a fan base to sort of build up a like a mythos in their head, you know, of like, who is that artist behind the scenes? So I think that that's cool that you lean into that. I want to maybe follow up on the idea of like, okay, the music starts to switch tones. And then wh when does this decision come in to start a new project with a new name? And how do you make that decision versus saying, I'm just going to take my current artist identity and, and evolve it and go in a different direction? Like, was that a hard decision? Or is that a very clear decision for you to make? Like, I'm definitely going to separate these two things. Uh, yeah, I think it, it was kind of clear when uh, the new music I was making didn't fit like my previous vibe. Uh, the only thing I 
I had uh, some doubts with was like if I should stop my previous project and start a new one. That yeah. was like a difficult decision. So I decided not to do that. And I just started a new project and and kept on releasing music under both alias. And that's what I'm doing now. And I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to declare someday, you know, in, in my Instagram or something like, Boofy is dead, and now I'm only going to do music as well. No, I'm not. I'm not going to shut the door. Definitely, I'm just going to leave it open, and whatever I want to make, some music that I think could fit with the with the alias, I will release it under that name, and and that's it. So, I took that decision because I think it's the most practical one. Yeah. Totally. Uh, we just had a question come in from chat, and I want to remind folks that if you do have questions and they fit into the conversation, we'll weave them in today. And I want to say hello to Omar and Karina and uh, Billy Bob, Kalana, Wonderful and Wander, and Powell, who just asked, a, I think, a valuable question, which is, uh, when you work as a DJ, uh, do you play your own music, um, other music from other artists? And I guess the question is, I'm trying to d translate here, like, uh, what do you find more fun? Do you, f do you incorporate your own music in addition to other people's music in your sets? And then uh, is there one that's more fun than the other, I guess, is the question? Yeah, that's a good question. I used to play... I used to rarely play my music because I always felt bad if it did, it didn't work well on the dance floor right. or if if I felt that the the mix wasn't ready or you know something like that even if the crowd was dancing but I heard like some bad EQ snare or something like that some uh, poorly balanced stuff on the mix I was like no this is crap I, and uh, I won't play it again until it's better. And and that feeling, I, I guess, made me not to play a lot of my music. It's a level of anxiety that gets added yeah. into the set. Yeah. Yeah. So so I I kept on playing other people's music, but then uh, over the time I gradually changed that because I started playing live more and more. Like a well a live setup, which is for um uh, like made for the dance floor, made for the club. It's like a really small setup, just laptop, uh, Ableton push, and maybe one or two synths, like a drum machine to improvise and beats and a synth to which uh has a sequencer preferably like the micro freak you have back there yeah that synth it's amazing to play live because it has a very flexible uh sequencer and very easy to use and fast so yeah i i make a live with that live session and then i realized that yeah it's cool and i should play my music more and yeah now i play it a lot more I even do some DJ sets just with my music wow. with uh, good results. And if I have some trouble, you know, like with the mixes and stuff like that, I, I don't get that frustrated as before. For sure. And also, I think my mixes got better. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, time, so. is it a result of like your skill building and, and what steps did you sort of take to to build those skills when you started to notice like, hey, these mixes aren't matching up? Like, what did you start to do to uh, improve those mixes? Yeah, well, it helped me a lot getting better at mixing when I started teaching mixing. <laughs> Interesting. It's it, it's funny because, yeah, I, I just remember my first lessons, my first... Uh, teaching lessons uh, that I that I gave a few years ago, like, I don't know, four or five years I started teaching. Uh, not on a regular basis, just like and uh, now and then. And and I was I wasn't really sure of what I was talking about. I had to learn in the process of teaching. Uh, it forced me to learn a bit more in detail what i was right. talking about so I, I learned a lot there and and that started you know like a learning process that 
I think it it hasn't finished. Yeah. I don't think it ever finishes. It it uh, yeah it never finishes. But but my mix has got better, faster. I think I I I work less to make them sound good. I think. Yeah. Now. I think when I think for a lot of beginners, it, it does feel like you need to keep adding stuff and you need to keep tweaking and you need to like make it more complicated to make it sound good. And then what I found over time is like the simpler you can make things is what gets it to sound good. Totally, totally agree. And that's what I tell my my students now. Don't don't get too uh, overly don't abuse the plugins that's that's the first thing i say yeah. don't abuse the don't put just you know eqs and uh, preamp simulators and uh, all over all over the the session just for the sake of it because right. i've seen people doing that like they think like it should it should sound better right i'm gonna put a preamp here or a compressor because it should sound better because that's what the pros do they put preamps and compressors and fancy plugins and i'm all, always saying that you don't need to do that and also the uh, ableton's built-in plugins are amazing they're with every update of the of the software they're better and uh, they're lighter right uh, than than vsd but that that's my opinion I don't. I don't judge people using VSDs. Yeah. They're, defi there are some amazing they're definitely they're definitely lighter, and it's a lot less expensive uh, to just buy exactly. buy the DAW and use what comes in the DAW for sure. That's epic. Exactly. I wonder, uh, blending the two worlds again, DJing and production. How much do you? Uh, how much did you learn about mixing? Not just based on being in the studio, but based on being in the club, uh, based on like a like a house system. You know what I mean? And and do you? Uh, mix differently for uh or does or just having a track knowing that it might get played um out in a club on a big system uh, does that inform your mixing you mean like if i if i get feedback from mixing at a club uh, that's the question like even if you just like play something that you made in a set i wonder if and and you hear it on a big system versus you hear it in in the studio i wonder if you're going back and making either separate mixes like one that's just for like listening pleasure one that's for the live version or if there's some happy medium you found in between between like okay this sounds good in the club on the big system and it sounds good on like consumer headphones or whatever i just wonder if that informs your process at all okay yeah it definitely influences the process but i don't do separate mixes like one for the house and one for the club right i, I don't do that if i go to a club and I hear some stuff that I need to fix. It's it's gonna sound different in the studio always, totally. mostly because you don't have those sub uh, subwoofers that uh, clubs have. But uh, yeah, that's what I that's why I bought a subwoofer because I think it's important to have one if you're making dance music, yeah, or any kind of music. But uh, uh, yeah, I I just get some uh, notes, mental notes, or sometimes I write it down on my cell phone or whatever, like stuff like uh, less less sub on the bass, right. on the kick drum, mostly on the bass. That, that was one of my most common errors, having a very big, big drum, uh, kick drum and a very big Subby bass. bass. Yeah. yeah, both together, no, bad idea. For so, sure. well, it, yeah, it it all depends, but uh, it usually made the subwoofers in the club like yeah, you know, excessively low. Uh, while in my studio, it was like okay, of course. But then after listening, listening to that in in a club, to the to all those bass frequencies, to 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 too much, yeah, to all over the place. Then you go back to your studio and and you listen to it differently. Yeah, you learn to adjust ears. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You talked about a really cool live setup that you mentioned, like with using push and like a like a couple a synth and a drum machine. Um, I wonder what's your process for taking a track that you made in the studio and converting it to a live performance? Is there um, 
Uh, does the arrangement become different? Do you alter the track for live? I'd, I'd love to hear about that process. Yeah, I I think one of the greatest things about making live electronic music is that you can improvise a lot. Yeah, because la uh, electronic music structures are so simple. It's basically, like house music and techno is basically just breaks and not breaks. You know, right. like kick and section without the kick. Like, like a, in a very simplistic way, of course, it's it's more than that. But uh, you can play with that, with that simplicity. And I like to improvise a lot. And I like to change the, the structure of my tracks. So what I do is I just bounce like six stems of my tracks. I, uh, I have kick individually drums, percussions, synths, bass, and vocals. Nice. Mostly. And that's universal yeah. across like all the tracks, so you can put them in one set? Yeah, exactly. They all have the same uh, standard stamp, so they can all be in the same track, like the kick track for the whole live session, the bass track for the whole live session. And I use the session view, and I do 16-bar uh, loops over the... So I put them... First, I put them in the in the arrangement view, and I divide every sixteen bars. Yeah. And then I put it on the other side, and then I can play with the with the Ableton push. If I want to, if I want to go with the original structure, I can. I I can just trigger uh, the scenes. Trigger the scenes going down. Uh, but I, if I say like, okay, this this is enough. The break is too long, and I want to go back to the to the to the bass and to the you know yeah uh, I can do it whenever I want you know and that's the flexibility I have and mostly I get to play and improvise between tracks you know the right. moment that the go the bass goes off in one track and uh, I'm waiting to put the other bass on the other track from the next track I can do a lot of stuff in between like uh, improvise with the synthesizers. Uh, make a new sequence and yeah it's pretty fun uh, I, I i can if i have a drum machine over there i can make a new beat and then i put the new track so it's kind of like a hybrid between yeah. a dj and a live i got a lot inspired by kink you for know, sure kink. and yeah. all the controllers that he uses <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah my life it's very much inspired by his, uh, with the difference that he doesn't make the stamps. He uh, he has like only one stamp to track, and uh, it's kind of like live stuff. sampling vinyl and stuff like yeah, that, and looping. Exactly. He, yeah. he does a lot more live stuff than I do. It's intense. I'm not as uh, as talented as he, as he is with the <laughs> with the fingers. It He's also so is just bad. like you want to. You want to, the, the struggle is you want to preserve some of the original track, but you yeah. also want to honor that it is a performance, you know? So I think the, the, the method that you described, it, it seems like the perfect blend between the two for having a, a comfortable live performance that is, um, you know, bringing your material and then adding something to it. Exactly. Exactly. I, I totally agree. I, I heard some live, uh, live acts from other people that are, totally improvised and what it happens most of the time is that it's very slow sure you know yeah. the, all the transitions because you have to because you, you especially if it's just one person right if you have to build people, everything yeah if it's two people it can change a lot it can be a lot more dynamic but if it's only one person you're not an octopus you have to be <laughs> one thing or two most uh, maximum at a time uh, so yeah it tends to be a bit slow the build-ups the breaks everything tends to be a, a bit slow and I think it's because of that because you need to take care of the drums and then the synth and you know and right. it all takes a little bit of time while if you have a computer you can just you know play on top of something that it's already built and maybe change a little bit of that of the 
the sequence and the structure like I do. For sure. I want to say hello to a couple new people in chat. What's up, Craig, Noah, Ronnie, and El Tacos? What's going on? Thank you all for joining. Feel free to throw questions in the chat, my friends. Make sure you like the stream uh, while you're here if you are enjoying it. And also, if you're just tuning in now, don't worry. The full interview will be up uh, later. And I would like to remind everybody that Theos has a pro sessions coming up this weekend. So if you want to get a deep dive, and I, I think you're going a little more, um, you know, People are going to be able to dive into some of your projects. We'll actually see the behind the curtains in your DAW and all that stuff. Um, so please check out that link in the description. And you can save with code Tatro Talks at checkout. So check out that link in the description. Use the coupon code if you are interested in signing up for the pro session. Um, but before we go, I want to talk more about gear and, and performing and all that stuff because that's that's a lot of fun to talk about, but I also want to bring it back down for some of the folks who are getting into this world and asking, you know, how do you start paying the bills as an electronic musician, as a producer, as a DJ? Like, I'm curious if you have, I think everybody, pretty much everybody that I've interviewed has had similar pathways, but, but diverse, different pathways at the same time. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how you started generating some income as a musician? Because I think that seems to be the biggest hurdle for people. Yeah. Well, it's easy. You just live with your parents and don't pay the bill. Exactly. That, Perfect. That's the secret. Number one advice. <laughs> no, uh, I'm joking. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's uh, possible. In my case, teaching was the solution in the in the early years of my yeah. career and now that i'm switching more to uh, incomes from production it's all about the internet and uh yeah building a portfolio of clients i'm getting clients through my social networks uh through uh fiber and those uh you know, uh, freelance pages that uh, many people don't know. Actually, I've, with the I've talked with a few producers about it, and they don't know about these uh, pages, like uh, this uh, website, and and they're really helpful. The only thing is that it's so competitive already. Right. There's a lot of people offering the services, so you need to start from the bottom. And you need to start charging very, very low. Like, uh, I don't know. I used to charge a lot more for making a mix, like outside of of this uh, website. But now that I got into it, I know that uh, I need to charge less in order to get my first clients. And I've been doing that. And slowly, I've been raising up the, the prices. Nice. But, uh, yeah. But... Uh, yeah, I think those are the type of things that you can do. Otherwise, uh, you can do YouTube like you do. For I sure. guess you have a, an income from it. Yeah. I mean, um, it all goes into the teaching thing, what, what you said about teaching. And there's a number of ways because, of course, what I went to – I was a music major and right out of music school, like – the only real, real marketable skills you've got is like pass on the knowledge that you've just learned. And then also maybe you can dip the toe in the water of whether it's, you know, mixing or performance or whatever. But if you're fresh out of school or if you're new to all of this, like, it, it, and it benefits you in multiple ways too, because you talked about teaching, informing your, your mixing knowledge too, because once you have to explain something back to somebody, once you have to convey like a, an idea, you really learn how much of it you actually understand and how much of it you need to uh, dive deeper and understand better. So in a way, teaching is not just a way to earn income and pass on knowledge, um, but it's also like a way to really get better at the thing that you're teaching, you know? Yes, Totally. Yeah, that's that's another source of income. Yeah, that I have currently with a uh, with everything that's happening. Um, and yeah, basically, is that. I also find that like teaching is like when you talked about like taking on your first mixing students and stuff. Like you're you're probably way better at mixing now than you were back then. But I feel like people. Think that they need to be experts in everything that they teach when yes there's value in that but also you just kind of need to know 
a bit more than the person you're teaching, like to just pass exactly. on knowledge, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. I, I was a bit intimidated by teaching because of that. Yeah. So I, I need to be like, you know, a real... You know everything and anything yeah, about the subject. A master about everything, but yeah. it's not true. You just need to know a bit more than your students. And yeah. that's it. I'm curious... And I know, I know how to transmit exactly. the knowledge. That, that's important as well. Yes, if you can, if you know how to explain things like really clearly and make it accessible to people, then it definitely improves your own skills because then makes simplifies your process and your thinking too. Um, I'm exactly. I'm curious more about the the Fiverr, the freelance side of things because it sounds like you're having a, a fair amount of success uh, with it. I'd love to hear more about that because I think a lot of people probably uh, sleep on that, probably don't know too much about it. I don't know if I would call it success, but I've already got a, a couple of clients from there yeah and they are recurrent clients so they they've ordered more than once from from me which i think it's good uh but it's it's difficult I, as, as i said the competition is very tough and the prices are very low right because of because of the the competition uh is it the right word competition? Yeah, for uh, sure. It's like there's if somebody's offering a mix for five dollars and you're offering yeah. a mix for three hundred dollars. I mean, at yeah. some point. But then you, it feels like since you have recurring clients and things, you're able to up the price and charge more, and people understand the quality, the value proposition more. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. But it, it's it's just an alternative source of income. Yeah, so uh, I, I wouldn't be able to depend on that for now. And yeah, I hope to grow the the portfolio of clients. I'm offering like all kinds of uh, services now, mostly production in different styles of music. I can, well, I think I can do from hip hop to reggaeton to techno to right. pop music. To, yeah, I'm offering all of that stuff, indie in the type of sound as well. I'm offering film scoring. I'm offering your one stop shop recording. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. That's awesome. I think my, my mindset with like income and music is like, I just want to be doing anything related to music and generating income from it. I think people block off certain things. So they feel like, oh, that's not 100% what I want to do. But I think like you want to be an artist, you got to kind of broaden that view and just go with all the all these things can generate revenue you don't have to do one thing or you don't have to hold yourself yeah. to doing one thing well yeah it all depends if, if you're happy doing it then do it I, i'm happy right. doing all types of music of course i prefer to do some stuff than others but uh it's good to have like you know challenges sometimes uh sometimes they ask me to do like stuff that I'm not used to do and it's a good challenge and sometimes they ask me to do some stuff that I I I know I would be happy doing right uh, it, it will be a hard time for me and I just decline those offers yeah and sometimes learning what those things are is just as valuable as learning what learning about the things that you really don't like that make you completely unhappy is just as important about learning about the things that make you happy Yeah, because you can draw a line. You, you need to experience them before you know. You exactly. You a little bit. <laughs> yes. Before you know it's not for you. All right. Let's, yeah. let's shift and talk about gear because I know some folks in the chat are noticing the gear behind you. And I know we've already kind of touched on live performance. It sounds like you have a pretty minimal live performance setup and you talked about using live. So I'm curious about your uh, approach. It seems this blended experience in the box and then out of the box. Like, uh, how would you describe? Oh, nice. We get a little even you more of a view. A little bit more. A little um, bit. So, yeah, that's basically my my setup for the studio and it's all made so I can make the music without using the DAW. Nice. So that's a completely dollar setup right there. It could be, yes. Even though I, I always use Ableton as the right. master plug and it's always running because I'm always recording the stuff that I do there. Uh, I, yeah, I can do a whole track with 
this setup because I have a, a sequencer, a long sequencer, which is a Pizza Pro. I have the modular setup. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I have a drum machine there, microfreak, a couple of guitar pedals. I have this guitar pedal from Line 6, which is like a multi effects called HX Stomp. Nice. Uh, super useful. I love it because, yeah, it had, it's it's a good solution for effects. I use it uh, as a send effect, as a return effect with my sound card as the as the mixer. And yep. I I mix in the box with a mixer with a sound card software, and I can send uh, individually effects and. Uh, yeah, and stuff from every synth that I have here. So every synth have, can have a its own individual send output to the effects. And I have the HX stomp and I have the chaos pad, chaos pad. Nice. Uh, also, which is like kind of like outdated for some people. I feel like I think it's dope. Outdated. It it does have that chunky look to it, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I love it, and it's very good for live. Totally. I I haven't found another thing like it for live because of the looping capabilities. Right. Uh, And all the, you know, easy access, effects tweaking. So yeah. The easy Uh, access thing. How? Can you just like turn all these things on and walk up to it and start making music? Like, is it that convenient? With this? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. 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 Totally. And yeah, how I important is that for you, for your process? Because that's like having a piano in a house. You walk up to a piano, you can play it, you can instantly start making music. This seems like the electronic equivalent of that. You might have to flip some yeah. on switches, but you just walk up to it and start making. Yeah. I have, I have a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse. Mm-hmm. So I just get a, I just get installed there with the keyboard and the mouse. Nice. And I just use them to press on and off record on the on the on the live session. Yep. But everything there can get uh, immediately synced through the BeatStep Pro, which gets the clock from the computer, and then I spread the clock over everything. Everything has uh, well. Some of the synths there have the MIDI have a MIDI cable going directly from the sound card, but most of them get plugged from the Pizza Pro, especially the modular. And yeah, it's all it's all ready. I, I just press play and everything starts running. The Volcas have their own sequencer and they're yeah. always in sync. Although I had a this kind of weird problem that uh, maybe you had, like. They only get in sync when I'm using session view. Interesting. But if, if I'm using arrangement view, they get out of sync weirdly. I mean, they still are in sync, but the start trigger doesn't trigger on time. It's That's so, so weird. Odd. I, I, I sent emails to Ableton. Nobody knows what happened. Nobody doing. knows. Yeah. That's so yeah. funny. Interesting. I, I don't know. I wonder um, with all that hardware there, is a hundred percent of your sound coming from the hardware, or do you end up filling any gaps later with uh, VSTs or software instruments? Yeah. So the process would be normally would be I I just press play and I make the first sounds here, like with all the hardware. I make the I make most of the track with it, and I record. I record. Uh, not everything at the same time. I record instrument by instrument. I mean, I mean, I make a, a beat here yep. that can run, you know, like totally dullless. But then I record instrument by instrument because I used to record everything at the same time. I I have the capability to do that because of my sound card. I can record everything multi multi track, but I don't do it anymore because I I think it's better. It works better when I focus on every little thing that I'm recording one at a time, you know? Right. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. So you're like building up the full, like the full loop, the full beat, 
and then you're paying special attention to each individual part when it comes time to record them. Exactly, exactly. I I can, for example, if I'm recording the drum machine, I can play with the with the knobs there, you right. know, opening and closing hi hats and stuff like that. Uh, and I I usually record clips, and then I keep on jamming. I just turn down the volume of my of, of the instrument I just recorded, and I use the clip from from Ableton, and I just keep on jamming until I have everything recorded right on on clips, you know. And then I go to the computer, and then I decide if I need more stuff. Sometimes I need more stuff, usually effects, uh, fields, stuff like that. Yeah. Like drum fields and uh, yeah, most, mostly like small arrangements. So not a lot of soft synths. It's all mostly the hardware. And and sometimes soft synths. Sometimes I replace the bass. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, but usually if I'm gonna replace the bass, I'm gonna do it in the box. Yeah. So is that I'm just to get a cleaner to sound or? What? No, I did, just because it's faster. Oh, got it. Yeah, I I have this. Uh, I don't know if it's anxiety, but I have to do things fast. Otherwise, I get, you know... Uh, inspiration is gone like that, you know? The inspiration yeah, goes motivation. away. I get saturated. I I, I lost... Uh, I lose objectivity. Yep. Uh, yeah, for many reasons. So I have to do things fast. And if if I have a, an idea already of a hardware base that could replace the base that I have, I just do it, you know? I, I yep. do it quickly. But if I'm going to look out for something new and I, I don't have a clear idea of what I want, it's usually faster with uh, with software. In that case, I use a lot the analog lab from Arturi. Nice. I think it's very handful, uh, uh, helpful for that. You can scroll between presets and, you know, in the, in the case that you don't have a clear idea of what you want that's that's a good uh, help you know just scrolling by presets and you're gonna find something probably something good for sure can we go completely off topic and can you tilt your laptop slightly more the other direction so we can see the animal that's that's there <laughs> that is just taking shape <laughs> i can't even tell that cat is chilling is that the studio cat that's a, that's a house cat. I that's mean, the house I'm, cat. I'm, 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 I'm at, my, at my place. Nice. Yeah, this is my home. Home studio. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's great. There's also a, a dog, actually. There's yeah. a dog there as well. Uh, you can see it in the background. Oh yes. Cosmo. Cosmo. Oh, wow! <laughs> Blending in in the background. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's the color of the of the of the floor. Of the floor, yeah. We love that. <laughs> I'm sure they love jamming in the studio too. Have they, you? yeah, they do. They always come when I'm here. They are. Uh, they like music, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, sorry, I just had to go on that. I just had to notice, but I'm glad we got the bonus dog too. So that's epic. You, you like cats? You have a cat? Uh, uh, no, I we have a do I have a dog here. I I've had a I've had cats before though. I love love them both. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's bring it back to the music because we had a question come in from uh, chat. Omar Chavez asks, what was the inspiration behind Labios Rojos? Oh, Labios Rojos was uh, a goofy track that I released in 2011, I think. And, well, it's kind of a cover of a ska song from a very well-known Mexican band called uh, Los de Abajo. And I decided to make a house version of it. It's it's not a remix. It's not a cover. I just sampled, you know, right. like most many electronic music artists, they just sampled stuff. I sampled it. Then over the time, like some people have said that it's a cover that it's a remix, I don't know, whatever, but uh, uh, the yeah, lines get blurry in electronic music for sample. sure. Yeah, exactly. But it's based on a sample, a guitar sample, 
Nice. And it's it's a it's kind of a dorky, quirky track that I, I don't I don't play much anymore, but people like it a lot. It's very joyful. Nice. It's very yeah, it's very uplifting. But it has a weird vibe that I, I still like. For sure. Uh, so awesome. yeah. Do you want to talk about the, the session? Absolutely. Let's do it because we're getting towards the end of the hour. Do you want to give us a little preview about what you're planning on covering and, and what it's going to look like for the two days? Sure. So I chose to make the session about Maxwell Live plugins in Ableton Live. Amazing. Let me just set it up for the audience too and remind them. So Teos has a pro session with 343 Labs this weekend. Uh, anybody can sign up. It's a two-day kind of thing. There's two sessions. It's a great way to spend the weekend. It's kind of a deep dive, and Darius is about to tell us um, exactly what you'll be diving into. But use the code Tatro Talks because you can get a discount, and the link is in the description. So check that out. That coupon is only good for uh, 24 hours after this interview. So take advantage, and it's this coming weekend. But yeah, go ahead. Tell us. So Max for Live devices. I'm, I'm interested. Max for Live devices. So I chose to do that because I feel like a lot of people get a bit intimidated by Maxwell Live plugins, especially beginners. I do, for sure. <laughs> you do? Okay. Yes. But you shouldn't because uh, they're free, most of them. They're easy to use, like most of, uh, like any other plugin. Maybe, yeah, some of them might be a little bit more difficult to use, of course, more experimental stuff. So that's why I'm gonna give a, a session about that. And we're going to just peel the surface of it. Yeah. We're not going to get into programming because for people that doesn't know, Max for Life is, a, is the app. It's an adaptation of the Max MSP uh, programming language Yep. made for Ableton. And uh, you can make plugins with it. It's, uh, it's, a it's intense. Language. I had a professor. She's a like a... Arhu Virtuoso, but she also does electronic music and processes, and she would build her own stuff in Max, and I would just look at it and say, I have no idea. I'll take the pre-built yeah. stuff in Max for Live any day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it can be intense, but that's why we're not going to get into programming yeah. at all. We're just going to check some of my favorite plugins, how I use them. I'm going to give some examples in tracks that I made. I'm also going to do some stuff from scratch using the plugins. And we're going to see all kinds of plugins from sequencers, which uh, you don't have in a build with the built-in Ableton plugins. You don't have a sequencer. The most, uh, uh, the thing that gets closer to it is uh, the arpeggiator, yep. maybe. So sequencer. Mm, we're also going to see some weird delays and uh, yeah, some stuff to make uh, weird sounds. Because I think experimenting with music is something that gives a lot of value to your productions. Even sure. if you're doing very commercial music, you you have to you have to try it. You have to. You, you have to try it because it's part of what makes electronic music interesting, you know, Absolutely. all the sonic experimentation. And so I think it can fit with uh, any type of genre that uh, you're interested in. I think that um, that's a perfect, yeah. the Max for Live subject is perfect because there are so many Max for Live devices in live and it's just a little bit overwhelming, but you're right because some of the best experimental stuff that's going to get you kind of like a new sound or, or just a different take stuff you can't do otherwise without these devices is there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, one of my favorite Max for Live devices is Buffer Shuffler, and that is just like an amazing device for a really unique effect. Which one? Uh, Buffer Shuffler. I don't know. it. Yeah, basically it processes incoming audio in steps and it'll chop it up into into steps and you can so like say 16 steps of this incoming audio but then it can also dice it so for each step it can reverse the audio or it can mute the audio or play it forward um 
and then it it dices the way that it does that over time too, which is like uh, super fun. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like the new delay that has Ableton Eleven. Oh, maybe. Which is uh, gated delay. Have you seen? I have not played with gated delay. That's cool. Gated delay. Yeah. It, it yeah you can do that kind of stuff reverse and uh nice chop uh on steps yes but uh yeah it might be similar yeah that's yeah. awesome though that that's a f so it's max for life devices and then you're gonna build some tracks and you're gonna really like get into like uh, the process there and all your processing techniques with those effects it seems exactly yeah so at the end of the session i'm gonna share the plugins with the people awesome but Anyway, I'm, I'm going to use mostly free plugins. Great. Yeah. That's super accessible. So, folks, please check out the link in the description for the pro session this weekend. Take advantage of the code that works for 24 hours after this stream, Tejo Talks. Um, and spend your weekend with Deus Mago. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just I, I, I just want to repeat that this is a session for all kinds of levels. You don't need to be, you know, uh, advanced. Although if you're advanced using Ableton Live but haven't used uh, Maxwell Live plugins, this is just right for you. And if you're just starting with Ableton Live, this is also good for you. you right. You don't need to to be an expert in Ableton Live. It's just this additional tool that I'm gonna be showing to people that is super helpful, and I'm sure people is gonna like it. Amazing. Well, Thais, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. It was a great chat. Thanks to you for inviting me and keep doing those amazing videos. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Like we said before, if you want to sign up for the pro session this weekend, link is in the description. Use code Tatro Talks to get that discount, but it only works for 24 hours after today's stream. Um, if you tuned in late, don't worry. You can go back and watch this from the beginning. It will be up on both my channel and the 343 Labs channel, which you should make sure you subscribe to because I really want to get that channel to 10,000 subscribers and we're very, very close. So youtube.com slash 343 Labs, 343 Labs.com for more of our classes and et cetera. And also tonight, I will be live again at 7 p.m. PST, 10 p.m. EST, making some lo-fi boom bap. So make sure you tune into that. The pre-stream is already live on my channel if you want to set a reminder. All right, so that's going to be it. Deus, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, have thank a good one, everybody. Bye.